My lord, Northumberland. Ah, uh, what news, Lord Morton? Noble Earl, I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good, and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is wounded almost unto death. Prince Harry slain outright, and both the blunts killed at the hand of Douglas. The young prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk, Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Uh, saw you the field? Came you from Shrewsbury? Well, I speak with one, my lord, that came from thence. Ah, here comes my servant Travers that I sent on Tuesday last. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes with you? My lord of Morton turned me back with joyful tidings, right. and being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He told me that rebellion had ill luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. Ah, again, said he young Harry Percy's spur was cold, yeah. of hot spur, cold spur, that rebellion met ill luck. Look, here comes more news. Speak, Vernon. Didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where he pulled death. Put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. How doth my son and brother? The tempest and the whiteness in thy cheek is after the night told to tell thy errand. Douglas is living, and your brother yet. But for my lord, your son, he is. Why he is dead? You see what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes. Let for all this say not that Percy's dead. Now shakes thy head, and holds it fear or sin to speak the truth. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I'm sorry I should force you to believe. That which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed to Harry Monmouth, who swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In few is there, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooded once, took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his troops. And arrows fled not swifter towards their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. The sum of all is that the king hath won, and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. For this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison there is physic. And these news having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick having some measure made me well. Come, let us all put forth body and good. Tis more than time. And my most noble lord, I hear for certain, and dare speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man that with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son had only but the corpse. With shadows on the shores of men to fight, the word rebellion, it had froze him up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great boiling brook, and more and less to flock to follow him. I knew of this before, but this present grief hath wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, and counsel every man the actor's way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters, make friends with speed. Never so few, and never yet will need. <laughs> What says the doctor to my water? He said, sir, the water itself was a good and healthy water, but for the party that owned it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish, compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that tends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here sit before thee like a sow that has overwhelmed all a litter but one. 
Where's Bardolf? He's gone into Smithfields to buy your worship a horse. I bought him in Paul's. He'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. I could get me a wife in the stews. I am a man, horsed, and wived. <laughs> oh, sir, here's the Lord Chief Justice. What? He that committed the prince for striking about Bardolf. Wait close, I will not see him. What's he that goes there? Falstaff and place your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery. Call him back again. Sir John Falstaff! Boy, tell him I'm deaf. You must speak louder. My master's deaf. <laughs> I'm sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Yes, My good lord! God give your lordship good time of day. I'm glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad on good advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, have yet some smack of age about you, some relish of the saltness of time, and I beseech your lordship, have a reverent care of your health. Uh, Sir John, I sent for you, <laughs> before your expedition to Shrewsbury. Mm, and I hear his majesty's returned in some discomfort from Wales. I thought not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness has fallen into this same Orson apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray you let me speak to you. This apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy, a sleeping in the blood, a, a horse and tingling. What tell you me of it, be it as it is? It's a kind of deafness. <laughs> I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Very well, my lord, very well. Rather than please you, it is the disease of not listening or the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. <laughs> I said for you, when there were matters against you for your life, to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Mm. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. He that buckles himself in my belt cannot live in less. Your means are very slender and your waist is great. I would it were otherwise. <laughs> I would my means were greater, my waist slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. The youthful prince have misled me. You follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord. Virtue is of so little regard in these costermonger times that true valour is turned bareherd. Pregnancy is made a tapster. You that are old consider not the capacities of us that are young. Do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, and your wit single? <laughs> and every part about you is blasted with antiquity. And will you yet call yourself young? Five, 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 is it on? My lord, I was born about three o'clock in the afternoon with a white head and something around belly. For my voice, I lost it with hallooing and singing of anthems. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. For the box of the ears the young prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it, and the young lion repents. Marry not in sackcloth and ashes, but in new silk and old sack. Well, God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you on Prince Harry. I hear you're going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yea, and I thank your pretty sweet wit for it. All you that kiss my lady peace at home. There is not a dangerous action can peep out his head but what I'm thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last ever, but it was always a trick of our English nation, whenever they have a good thing to make it too common. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with the rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Well, be honest, be honest. And God bless your expedition. Fare you well. Commend me to my cousin, Westmoreland. Um, my lord! My lord! 
Will your lordship lend me a thousand pounds to furnish me for? <laughs> Not a penny. Not a penny. <laughs> well, fill me with a three-man beetle! Man can no more separate age and covetousness than he can part young limbs and lechery. But the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other. <sighs> Boy. Sir. How much money is in my purse? Seven groats and two pence. I can get no remedy for this consumption of the purse. <laughs> Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out. The disease is incurable. <laughs> Go bear this letter to my Lord John of Lancaster, Mr. Young Prince Hal. This to my Lord of Westmoreland. And this to old Mistress Ursula, whom I have promised to marry weekly since the first white hair appeared on my tinny tin tin. About it straight, you know where to find me. Pox of this gout. Or a gout of this pox. <laughs> For one or the other plays the rogue with my great tome. Well, it is no matter if I do halt. I have the wars for my colour. It'll make my pension seem the more reasonable. A good wit will make use of anything. I will turn diseases into commodity. Sir John? Hmm? Uh, hmm? Ah! <laughs> Thus have you heard our cause, and known our means, and my most noble friends, I pray you all, speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. Well, your grace. And first, Lord Mowbray, what say you to it? I well allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and precincts of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file of five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of Great Northumberland. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. We did, we may. Aye, Mari, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand for in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids incertain should not be admitted. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model. And when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection. Which if we find outweighs ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least desist to build at all? Much more, much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, consent upon a sure foundation. Grant that our hopes yet likely of fair birth should be still born, and that we now possess the utmost man of expectation. Uh, I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. Is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Vernon. For his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French and one against Glendower. Perforce a third must take up us. And so is the unfirm king in three divided. And his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. Who is it like to lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland. Against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French, I have no certain notice. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die and now become enamoured on his grave. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over-greedy love hath surfeited 
An habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. Oh, thou fond many. With what loud applause did thou beat heaven with blessing, Bolingbroke, before he was what thou wouldst have him be? And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder, art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard? And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up, ah. and howls to find it? Thoughts of men are cursed. Past and to come seems best. Things present worst. Shall we go draw our numbers and set on? We are time subjects and time bids me gone. Master Peg, have you entered the action? It is entered. But well, where's your yeoman? It's the lusty yeoman. Will he stand to each? No! Sir, we must arrest Sir John Forster. Right. What? <laughs> yes, Mr. Snare, I have entered him in all. It may chance cost some of us our lives, for he will stab. Well, that's a day. Take heed of him. He stabbed me in mine own house. Most beastly a good faith. He cares not what mischief he does if his weapon be out. He will find like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. And I but close with him. I care not for his thrust. Nor me neither. He is an infinitive thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, hold him sure. Good Master Snare, let him not scape. A hundred mark is a long one for a lone poor woman to bear. And I have borne and borne and borne and been fabbed off and fabbed off and fabbed off from this day to that day, until it is a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in that such dealing unless a woman should be made an ass. Yonder he comes, and that iron mom's in those knaves barred off with him. Do me your offices, do me your offices, Master Fang and Master Snare. Well, do me, do me, do me your offices. How oh, now? Whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Sir John Falstaff, I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. Go away, Barnett's draw, Barnett. I'll cut the villain's heads off. Uh, throw the queen the in the channel. Throw me in the channel! I'll throw me in the channel! Wilt thou, wilt thou, thou bastardly rogue! Uh, uh, murder! Lord, and please your grace, I am a poor widow of East Cheap, and he is arrested at my suit. For what sum? Well, it's for more than some, my lord. It's for all I have. <laughs> he has eaten me out of house and home. He put all my substance into that fat belly of his. But I shall have some of it out again, and I shall ride thee the nights like a mare. How comes this, Sir John? Fie! Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come by her own? What is the gross sum I owe thee? Hmm? Mary, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too, thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by sea coal fire on Wednesday in Wheaton Week when the prince by thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor 
Thou didst swear to me then as I was washing thy womb to marry me and make me thy lady, thy wife. Now canst thou deny it? Oh, and did not good wife teach the butcher's wife come in then and call me gossip quickly, coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us you'd a good dish of prawns, whereby thou did desire to eat some, whereby I told thee there was ill for a green wound. Green and wound. didst thou not when she was gone downstairs bid me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long we should call me madam and didst thou not kiss me and bid me fetch thee thirty shillings thou art put thee now upon thy book host deny it if thou canst my lord my lord <laughs> My lord, this is a poor mad soul, and she walks up and down the town and says her eldest son is like you. Oh! <laughs> She'll be in good case, and the truth is, poverty hath distracted her. Mm, Sir John, Sir John, I'm well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause, the false way. You have, as it appears to me, practiced on the easy, yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses, both in purse and in person. Yea, in truth, my lord. And pray thee peace. Shh! I'll pay her the debt you owe her, and unpay the villainy you have done with her. The one you may do with sterling money, the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. The man will make curtsy and say nothing is virtuous, no, my good lord. My humble duty remembered, I say unto you, I do desire deliverance of these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong. But answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy the poor woman. Come hither, hostess. My lord! And I'm out of harbour, you? The king, my lord, and Harry, Prince of Wales, are near at hand. Mm -hmm. The rest of the paper tells. Mm -hmm. As I am a gentleman. Well, Fife, you said so before. Oh, come no more words. As I am a gentleman. Well, by this heavenly ground I tread on, I must pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses. Glasses is the only drinking. And for the walls, a pretty slight drollery. Oh, the story of the prodigal. Oh, the German hunting in Vorterberg is worth a thousand of these bed hangers and fly-bitten tapestries come. Make it ten pound if thou canst. Oh! And it were not for thy humours. There's not a better wench in all England. Go oh, wash thy face and withdraw the action. Come, come, come. Thou canst not be in this humor with me. Dost not know me? Come, come. I know thou wast set on to this. Oh, Sir John, hmm? make it be but twenty nobles. Well, I'm loath to pawn my plate in good truth, Lord. Let it alone. I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Oh, uh, you shall have it. Thou art pawn my gown. I hope you come to supper. Mm. You'll pay me all together. Will I live? Go with the bottle. Hook on, hook on. Will you have tall tear sheep meet you at supper? Oh, let's have her. Come. No more words. I have heard better news. What is the news, my lord? Well, the king tonight. At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope my lord all's well. What is the news? Come all his forces back? No. Fifteen hundred fought five hundred horse and marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Is the king returned from Wales, my noble lord? You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good master Harper. Yes, sir. My lord! My lord! What's the matter? My lord. Master Harcourt! Shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Mr. John, you loiter right here too long, being you have to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Will you sup with me then, Master Harcourt? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? 
If they become me not Master Harcourt, he was a fool that taught them to me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. Now the Lord lighten thee. Thou art a great fool. God, I'm exceeding weary. It's come to that. I had thought weariness does not have attached one of so high blood. Well, it does me, though it discolours the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. <laughs> Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? A prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Oh, but like then my appetite was not princely got, for by my troth I do now remember the poor creature's small beer. <laughs> uh, indeed, these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. <clears throat> what a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name. <laughs> hmm? Or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note... How many pair of silk stockings thou hast, viz. these and those that were thy peach-coloured ones? Now, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use. <laughs> Though that indeed the tennis court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keeps not racket there. How ill it follows after you have laboured so hard that you should talk so idly. Mm. How many good young princes would do so? Their father, being so sick as yours at this time is. Shall I tell you one thing, Poins? Yeah, faith, and let it be an excellent good thing. It is not meet I should be sad now my father is so sick. Albeit I could tell to thee as to one it pleases me of a fault of a better to call my friend. I could be sad. And sad indeed, too. Oh, very hardly upon such a subject. Well, by this hand, thou thinks me as far in the devil's book as thou and Falstaff. Let the end try the man. I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. But keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? Well, what wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. Ha! <laughs> yeah, be every man's thought. Hmm. And not a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Not a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. <laughs> yes, every man would think me a hypocrite indeed. <laughs> and what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why? Because thou hast been so lewd. Hmm? And so much engraft to Falstaff. And to thee. <laughs> but it's like I'm well spoke on. Mm. I can hear it with my own ears. The worst they can say of me is that I am a second brother and a proper fellow with me hands. And those two things, I confess, I cannot help. <laughs> yeah, brother, massive. Bottle. Yeah, the boy that I gave false start. He had him from me, Christian. Look, if the fat villain had not transformed him, a can't <laughs> save your grease. And yours, most noble Bada. And how doth thy master, Bada? <laughs> well, my lord, he heard of your greasy's coming to town. There's a letter for you. Oh, oh delivered with good respect. And how doth the mark will mass your master? In bodily health, sir. Yeah, marry, the immortal part needs a physician. Yeah, I do allow this great wen to be as familiar with me as my dog. Look, you know, how he writes. Sir John Falstaff, knight. Every man must notice, as often as he has occasion, to name himself. Sir John Falstaff, knight to the son of the king nearest his father. <laughs> Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. This is a certificate. Peace. 
I will imitate the honourable Romans in brevity. Well, yeah, sure means brevity in breath. Short winded. I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. <laughs> Be not too familiar with points, for he misuses thy favours so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Repent at idle times as thou mayest, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say, as thou usest him, Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. My lord! I'll stick this letter in sack and make him eat it! But do you use me thus, <laughs> now? Must I marry your sister? Well, God send the wench no worse fortune, but I never said so. Oh, well. Thus we play the fools with the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London, Marlow? Yea, my lord. Where's Sutsy? Did the old boar feed in the old frack? At the old place, my lord, in East Cheap. Yeah, so any women with it? Oh, no, my lord. But our mistress quickly. And mistress Daltercy. <laughs> what pagan may that be? Ah, oh, a proper gentleman, sir. <laughs> and a kinsman of my master's. Yeah, even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> Shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? Oh, I'm your shadow, my lord. I'll follow you. Yes, you boy, and you bardo. Oh. Now, not a word to your master that I am yet come to town. Here's for your silence. Sir, I have no tongue. And for mine, I'll govern it. Go, go, go. This doll tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you. As common as the way between St. Albans and London. <laughs> How may we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colours and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leather aprons and jerkins and wait upon him at his table as drawers. Oh, from a prince to apprentice, a low transformation. That shall be mine. But in all things, the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, give even way unto my rough affairs. I have given over. I will speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honour is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet, for God's sake, go not to these wars. <laughs> The time was, father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, through many a north would look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven, brighten it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven. And by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait. And speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse, to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rule, humours of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, a wondrous him, a miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. Never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. But through your heart, fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. 
But I must go and meet with David there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland. Till that the nobles and the armed commons have, of their puissance, made a little pace. If they get ground advantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I a widow. Come, come. Go in with me. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, so time and vantage crave my company. Sir John cannot endure an apple, John. Oh, good bar of mass, I say it's true, yeah. You know the prince, he, he once sent a dish of apple John's before him, saying, here are five more Sir John's. <laughs> yeah. And put it off his hat, he said, I will now take my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered nights. <laughs> oh, it angered him for the heart, you know. But, um... Hey, you forgot that now. Oh, why then cover and sit them down? Oh, right. oh, and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Yeah? Mistress Dalter, she fain hear some music. Oh. Dispatch! <laughs> the room where they supped is too hot. They'll be in straight. Sure are. Here will be the prince and master point and all. Yeah. And they put on two of our jerkins and aprons. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Sir John must not know of it. Bard all for brought word. By the mass, here will be old Utis. Uh, it's an excellent strategy. Yeah. Right. I'll see if I can find out, Sneak. Right, right. If my sweetheart, methinks now you're in an excellent good temporality. Your pulses beats as extraordinarily as art would desire, and your colour, I warrant you, is as red as any rose in good truth law. <laughs> but if I, you've drunk too much canaries, and that's a marvellous searching wine, and it perfumes the blood of one can say, what's this? <laughs> How do you now? Better than I was. Why, that's well said. A good art's worth gold. John. Into the Jordan, into the Jordan. Oh no, Mistress Doll. Sick of a calm, ye good faith. <laughs> so it's all a sect. Once in a calm, they're all sick. Pox damn you, muddy rascal. Is that all the comfort you give me? You make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. I make them. Gluttony and diseases make them. I make them not. If the cook helped make the gluttony, you help make the diseases, Doll. We catch off you, Doll. We catch off you. Grant that, my <laughs> poor virtue. Grant that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Mary's joys are chains and our jewels. Your brooches, pearls and... Ouches. <laughs> For to serve bravely is to come halting off, to come off the breach with his pike bent bravely, <laughs> and to surgery bravely, and to venture upon the charged chambers 
Yourself, Sir John, there comes no swaggerers here. Uh, dost thou hear he is my ancient? Tilly fairly, Sir John, there tell me. And your ancient swagger, he comes not in these doors. Oh, I was before Master Tizik, the deputy, the other day, and as he says to me, it was no longer ago than Wednesday last, a good face. Yes, Neighbour quickly, says he. Master Dumb, our minister was by then. Neighbour quickly, says he, you receive those that are civil. For he says you're in an ill name. Yes. Now he said so, I can tell whereupon. For he says you're an honest woman and well thought on. Therefore take heed what guests you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. Yes. No, there comes none here. You would bless you to hear what he said. He is no. I'll no swaggerer. He is no swaggerer. What a tame cheater if he. You may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. Yeah. Call him up, draw. Yeah. Yeah. Cheater call you him? Well, I bar no honest man, my house, and no cheater neither, but I do not enjoy swaggering. I'm the worst when one says swagger. Well, feel you, gentlemen, how I shake. Look you, I warrant you. So you do, hostess. Do I? Oh, in very truth, I do. As for an aspen leaf, oh, I cannot abide swaggerers. <laughs> oh, God save you, Sir John. Welcome, ancient pistol. Pistol, I charge thee with a cup of sack. Do you discharge upon my hostess there? Oh, I will discharge upon her, Sir John, with two bullets. <laughs> <laughs> she is pistol-proof, sir. You shall hardly offend her. Come, I'll drink no proofs, nor no bullets neither. I'll drink no more than will do me good. For no man's pleasure, I. Ah, then to you, Mistress Dorothy. I charge you. Charge me? I scorn you, scurvy companion. What, you poor base cheating, rascally lackling and mate? Away, you mouldy rogue, away. I am meat for your master. I know you, Mistress Dorothy, eh? Away, <laughs> you cockpurse rascal. You filthy bang away. Oh. By this way. <laughs> I'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps when you play the saucy cattle with me away. You bottle ale rascal, you basket hilt stale juggler, you. Since when I pray you, sir? God's luck. Who points on your shoulder? Match. <laughs> God, let me not live, but I'll murder your rough for this. No more pistol. I would not have you go up here. Do you discharge yourself of our company? Yes, good Captain Pistol. Not here, sweet Captain. Captain? The abominable damned cheater. Are they not ashamed to be called Captain? You a Captain? You slave. For what? For tearing a poor horse rough in a boarding house. <laughs> captain, hang him, rogue. 
He lives upon mouldy stew prunes and dried cakes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. God's like these villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill sorted. Yeah. 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 Pretty go down, good ancient. Yeah. Ask the hither, Mr. Stone. Not I, couple bottom. I'm a tire. I'd be revenged of her. I'll pray thee go down. <laughs> I'll see her dumb first to Pluto's damned neck by this hand, with Erebus and torches vile also. <laughs> Hold, hook and line, see I, yeah. Down, dogs, down, feed us. <laughs> Have we not Irene here? <laughs> Good Captain Pizzo, be quiet. Tis very light he finds them. I beseech you, aggravate your collar. These be good humours indeed. Shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but 30 miles a day, compare with Caesars and with cannibals and truant Greeks? Nay. Rather damn them with King Cerberus and let the welkin roar! <laughs> Shall we fall foul for toys? Oh, Captain, these are very bitter words. Breathe go down, good angel. This will grow to a brawl anon. Diamond like dogs. Give crowns like pins. Have we not Irene here? <laughs> Upon my word, Captain, there's none such here. But what the good year, do you think I would deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. Then feed and be fat, my fair Galipolis. Come, give some sack. <laughs> See fortune, may torment her. Sperato, me contento. Absolutely. <laughs> Fee we broadsides? No. Let the fiend give fire. <laughs> Come, give some sack. And sweetheart, lie thou there. Come we to full points here. An Arctic sitter has nothing. But still I would be quiet. Oh, sweet knight. I kiss thy knee. What? We have seen the seven stars. For God's sake, thrust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a pasty and raw skull. Thrust him downstairs. No, we not Galloway Max. Coit him down, Bardolph, like a shove group shilling. Then he do nothing but speak nothing. He shall be nothing here. Come, get me down. Oh, what? Shall we have it, oh, oh, right. <laughs> Shall we improve? Ah, in death, rock me asleep. <laughs> Abridge my doleful days. Why then let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine a sister's thread? Come, Atropos, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my rapier, boy. Jack, a private, do not draw. Get you downstairs. Oh, here's a good leg, shoe mouth. Come on, Jack.
Thank you, awesome little guy of Bill and you. Are you not heir to the groin? Methinks he made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Yeah. Are you throwing downstairs, my dog? Yay, Sir John, the rascal's drunk. You, you heard him say to the shoulder. A rascal to brave me! He's sweetly riled you. Alas, poor I got that sweatest. Come, let me wipe thy face for thee. Come on, you old son, Charles. Oh, rogue, if I love thee. <laughs> Thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, where five of Agamemnon and ten times better than the nine worthies, villain. A rascally bragging slave, I will toss the rogue in a blanket. Do and thou darest for thy heart. And thou dost our canvassy between a pair of sheets. The music's come, sir. Let them play. Play, sirs. Come, doll. Sit upon my knee. A rascally bragging slave. A rogue fled from me like quicksilver. Fine. And now I've got a stim like a church. <sighs> oh. Oh. oh, you all some little tardy Bartholomew bull pig. When will thou leave fighting the days and coin in the nights and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Oh, peace, good doll. Do not speak to me like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. So what here was the prince of? A good shallow young fella. He would have made a good pantler. He would have chipped the bread well. The side point is a good wit. He a good wit, hanging baboon. His wit's as thick as Tewkesbury mustard. There's no more conceit in him than in a mallet. Why does the prince love him so then? Because their legs are both of a bigness. Because he plays quoits well and eats conger and fennel, and jumps upon joint stools, and rides the wild mare with the boys, and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories, and wears his boot very smooth like unto the sign of the leg, and such other gamble faculties he has as shows a weak brain and an able body, both of which the prince admits him, but the prince himself is just such another. The weight of a hair will not turn the scales of their avoir du poids. Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Well, he's beating before his hall. Ah, look, if the withered elder have not his pole clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange how desire should so many years outlive performance? <laughs> Kiss me, doll. Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac of that? Now just give me flattering buses. By my trough, I'll kiss thee with a most constant heart. I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love e'er a scurvy young boy of them all. What stuff will thou have a kirtle of? I shall have money a thirsty. You shall have a cab tomorrow. Come, a merry song. It grows late. Wheel to bed. Thou'll forget me when I'm gone. By my child, thou set me a weeping and thou say so. Prove that ever I dress myself handsome till thy return. Well, hearken the Some sack branches. No, 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 Are you come from Wales? Thou horse and mad compound of majesty. By this light flesh and corrupt blood, you're welcome hither. <laughs> ah, you fat fool, I scorn you. Oh. My lord, he'll drive you out of your avenge and turn all to a merriment if you take not the hate. Why, you horse and candle, mind you. Yeah. How vilely dost thou speak of me even now before this honest 
virtuous, civil gentlewoman. God's blessing of your good heart, and so she is, yeah. my Trouth. Didst thou hear me? Yeah. And did you meet? You knew I was at your back. You speak it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 no. I did not think thou wast within hearing. Oh, I'll drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, how am I not? No abuse. I'm not? To dispraise me, call me a uh, pantler and bread chipper and I know not what. No abuse, Hal. No abuse! No abuse, Ned. Honest Ned, no. No, I dispraise thee before the wicked, <laughs> that the wicked might not fall in love with thee. Oh, <laughs> no abuse, Hal. Honest Ned, no faith, boys, none. See now, with a pure fear and entire cowardice, don't thou make me wrong, this? Virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? No. no. Is thine hostess here of the wicked? No. Is thy boy of the wicked? No. Honest Bardal, whose zeal burns in his nose of the wicked. Yes! <laughs> the fiend hath pricked down Bardolf irrecoverable, yeah. and his nose is Lucifer's privy kitchen. For the boy there is a good angel about him, but the devil binds him too. Yeah, and for the women? For one of them she's in hell already and burns, poor souls. For the other I owe her money, though whether she be damned for that I know not. No, I warrant you. No, I think thou art right. I think thou art quit for that. My lord! <laughs> My lord! Uh, now, our court, what news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and weary posts come from the north. And as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns and asking every one for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven's points, I feel me much to blame! So I need to profane the precious time. As tempest of commotion begins to melt and drop upon our bare, unarmored heads. Falstaff, good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night. We must hence and leave it, hasn't it? Sir John, Sir John, you must to the court presently. There's a dozen captains standing over you, sir. Hey, the musician, sir. Oh, yeah. Farewell, hostess. Farewell, doll. You see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. The undeserver may sleep when men of action are called upon. Farewell, my good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will come and see thee again ere I go. I cannot speak. My heart be not ready to burst. Well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. I will. I will.
Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, my lords? <laughs> Tis one o'clock and past. Why then, good morrow to you both, my lords. Have you read all the papers that I sent to you? We have, my liege. And you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is as but a body yet distempered, which to its former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My Lord Northumberland will soon be cool. It's not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together. And in two years after they were at wars. It's but eight years since. This Percy was the man nearest my soul. Who, like a brother, toiled in my affairs and laid his life and love under my foot. Yeah. Who, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. Which of you was by when Richard, his eyes brimful of tears, did speak these words now proved a prophecy? Northumberland. Thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Though then God knows. I had no such intent. But that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. That time will come, lest did you follow it. That foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. And so went on. For telling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. These things become the hatch and brood of time. By the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guest. The great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to greater falseness. Are these things then necessities? Why then let us meet them like necessities? And that same word, even now, cries out upon us. They say the bishop and Northumberland are 50,000 strong. Oh, it cannot be, my lord. Rumour doth double, like voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. Please it, your grace, to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the power you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. To comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. Your Majesty has been this fortnight ill. And these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I'll take your counsels. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the Holy Land. And how doth my good cousin silence? Good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin your bedfellow? And your fairest daughter? And mine, my goddaughter, Ellen? Alas, a black oozel, cousin Shallow. By yea and no, sir. I dare say my cousin William is become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, cousin. To my cost. <laughs> I must then to the inns of court shortly. I was once of Clement's Inn, where I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. You were called lusty shallow then. <laughs> By the mass I was called anything. And I would have done anything indeed too, and roundly too. There was I... And little John Doit of Staffordshire, and Black George Barnes, and Francis Pickbone, and Will Squeal, a cots old man. You had not four such 
swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. And I may say to you, we knew where the Bonner Rovers were and had the best of them all at commandment. Then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy, and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This same Sir John cousin that comes hither and on about soldiers? The same Sir John, the very same. I see him break Scoggins' head at the court gate when it was a crack not this high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiterer, <laughs> behind Gray's Inn. Jesu, Jesu, the mad days that I have spent. <laughs> and to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. We shall all follow, cousin. <laughs> certain, tis certain, very sure, <coughs> very sure. Death, as the psalmist saith, is certain to all. All shall die. <laughs> How a good yoke of bullock at Stamford Fair. By my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. <laughs> is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Jesus, Jesus, dead. <laughs> I drew a fine bow and dead. I shot a fine shoot. John of Gaunt loved him well and betted much money on his head. Dead. I would have clapped in the clout at twelve score and carried you a four-hand shaft of fourteen and fourteen and a... How a score of ewes now? Thereafter, as they be, a score of good ewes may be worth ten pounds. And his old double dead. <laughs> Good morrow, honest gentlemen. Which, I beseech you, is Justice Shallow? I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county and one of the king's justices of the peace. What is your good pleasure with me? My captain commends him to you, sir. My captain, Sir John Falstaff. A tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. He greets me well, sir. I knew him a good backsword man. How doth the good knight? May I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? Sir, <laughs> pardon him. A soldier is better accommodated than with a wife. <laughs> it is well said, I think, and it is well said indeed to better accommodate. It is good, yea, indeed, is it. Good phrases are surely, and ever were, very commendable. A comedy. It comes from accomodo. Very good. A good phrase. Pardon? <laughs> Sir, I have heard the word phrase call you in. By this day I knew not the phrase but I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word and a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Accommodated. That is, when a man is, as they say, accommodated. Or when a man is being whereby he be thought to be accommodated, which is an excellent thing. It is very just. Hey, up, time. Look! Here comes good Sir John. Give me your good hand. Give me your worship's good hand. By my troth, you like well. And bear your years very well. Welcome, good Sir John. I am glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. <laughs> Uh, Master, uh, Shawcard, I think. Uh, no, Sir John, it is my cousin, Silence, in commission with me. Good Master Silence, it well befits that you are of the peace.
Hi, this is hot weather, gentlemen. <laughs> have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient of men? Mary, have we, sir? Will you sit? Let me see them, I beseech you. Where's the road? Where's the road? Where's the road? Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. So, 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 so. Yes, Mary, sir. Rafe Mulder. Let them appear as I call. Let them do so, let them do so. Let me see. Where is Moldy? Here and please you. What think you, Sir John? A good limbed fellow, young, strong, and of good friends. Is thy name Moldy? Yay and please you. Tis the more time thou had used. Trick him. I'd been pricked well enough before and you'd let me alone. And my old dame will be undone for wanting to do her husband in her drudgery. What do you have to prick me for? That's plenty better fit in a go than me. Go to, peace, Moldy. You shall go, Moldy. Tis the more time thou hast spent. Spent. Peace, fellow, peace. Stand aside. Know you where you are. If there's other Sir John, Simon Shadow. Yea, Mary, let me have him to sit under. <laughs> Where's Shadow? Here, sir. Whose son art thou, Shadow? My mother's son, sir. <laughs> His mother's son, and like enough thy father's shadow. If you like him, Sir John. Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him. We have many shadows fill up the muster book. <laughs> Thomas Wart. Where's he? Here, sir. Is thy name Wart? Yes, yeah, sir. Thou art a very ragged Wart. <laughs> Shall I prick him, Sir John? It was superfluous. His apparel is built upon his back and his whole frame stands upon pins. Prick him no more. You can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Francis Feeble. Here, sir. What trade art thou, feeble? A woman's tailor, sir. A woman's tailor? Will thou make as many holes in the enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? <laughs> well, I will do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor. Prick the woman's tailor well, Master Shallow. Deep, Master Shallow. I would wart might have gone, sir. Let that suffice, most forcible feeble. It shall suffice, sir. I am bound to the reverend feeble. <laughs> Who's next? Peter Bullcalf of the Green. Yea, Mary, let's see Bullcalf. Here, sir! For oh, God, a likely fellow prick him till he roar again. Oh, Lord, do my Lord, thou roar before thou art prick? Oh, Lord, sir, I am a diseased man. <laughs> what disease hast thou? Horse and cold, sir. A cough, sir. <coughs> uh, which I caught with ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Now well, we will have thee go to war in a gown, and we will have away that cold. And I will take such order that thy friends will ring for thee. Is here all? Here is two more called than your number. You must have but four here, sir. And so I pray you, go in with me to dinner. I will drink with you, but I will not tarry dinner. By my truth, I am glad to see you, good Master Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember, since we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field? Oh, no more of that, Master Shallow. Uh, it was a merry night. Mm. And is... Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow. She never could away with me. Never. Never. She would always say she could never abide, Master Shallow. By the mass, I could anger her to the heart. Mm. She was then a bonner robe. Doth she hold her own well? Old. Old, Master Shallow. Nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certain she's old. 
and had Robin nightwork by old nightwork before I came to Clement's Inn. That's 55 years ago. Cousin Silence, that thou had seen that that this night and I have seen. Ah, Sir John, said I well. We have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. That we have. That we have. That we have. <laughs> and faith, Sir John, we have. <laughs> Our watchword was ham boys. <laughs> Come, let's to dinner. Come, let's to dinner. Jesus, the days that we have seen. Come, come. M boys. Um. Good master, corporate Barnoff. Stand, my friend. And here's four Harry ten shillings in French crowns for you, sir. In very true, sir. I, I had as leave be Anders go, sir. Uh, Yet, yeah, for mine own part, I, I do not care but rather because I am unwilling and, and, and for mine own part have a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I, I did not care for mine own part so much. Yeah, go to stand aside. Good master corporal bad off for my old dame's sake stand, my friend. She'll have nobody to do for her when I'm gone. Oh. She's old and can't look after herself. You shall have four each, sir. Go to stand aside. By my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. An it be my destiny, so. And it be not, so. <laughs> no man's too good to serve his prince. And let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. Go to. Thou art a good fella. Hey, I'll bear no base mind. Come, sir, which men shall I have? Four of which you please. Psst. Psst. Sir John. A word with you, Sir John. My fair uh, nine, ten, eleven, two, uh, three pounds to free Moody and Bullcalf. Oh, go to, well done. Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Hmm. Do you choose for me? Marry then, sir. Moody. Bullcalf, Feeble and Shadow. Moody and Bullcalf. For your part, Moody, go home till you're past service. And for you, Bullcalf, grow till you come into it. I will have none of these. Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. These are your likeliest men, and I would have you served with the best. And Master Shallow, will you tell me how to choose a man? Care I for the limbs, the thews, the stature, bulk, and big semblance of a man? No, Master Shallow, give me the spirit. Ah. Here's what. You see what a ragged appearance it has. I will charge you and discharge you upon the motion of a pewterous hammer. And this same half-faced fellow Shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may, with as great an aim, level at the edge of a penknife, and for a retreat. How swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run away? No, Master Shallow, give me the spare men and spare me the great ones. Muddle Hawk, put me a caliber into Wart's hand. Oh, Wart, Travers, Huss, 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 and Huss. Go to. Come, Wart. <clears throat> Manage be your caliber. And ha! <laughs> ha! Top three. <laughs> Go to! Exceedingly good. Oh, well done. Oh, give me always the little old, lean, chopped, bald shot. Ah, well said, he faith. Ah. Hold, Wart. <laughs> Wart, thou art a good scab. There's a tester for thee. <laughs> he is not his craft's master. He doth not do it right. I remember at my land green, when I lay at Clement's Inn, I was then Sir Dagonet in Arthur's show. 
there was a little quiver fellow, and I would manage you his piece. Thus, and I would have and about, and come you in, and come you in, and the dog would have said, bounce would have said, and the will again and the dead would have said, I shall never see such a <laughs> I thank you, Master Shallow. These men will do very well. Borrow, give the soldiers their coats. You must excuse me, Master Shallow. I must a dozen miles tonight. Borrow, Borrow, march the way. By the front, kick march. Hip, 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 John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace. Mm. At your return, visit my house. Let our old acquaintance be renewed. Peradventure, I will with you to the court. For God would you would. Go to, I have spoke at a word. God keep you. Fare you well, gentle gentlemen. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do begin to see the bottom of this justice, Shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying. This same star of justice hath done nothing but prate to me about the wildness of his youth and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street. And every third word, a lie. I remember him in Clement's Inn when he was like a man made after supper of a cheese pairing. When he was naked, he was, for all the world, like a forked radish, <laughs> with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. He was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invisible. He was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monkey. And the horse called him Mandra. And now is this vice's dagger become a squire and talks as familiarly of John of Gaunt as if he'd been his sworn brother. Now I'll be sworn he ne'er saw him above once. That was in the tilt yard. Then he got his head banged in for crowding of the marshal's men. And now he has land and beefs. Well, if I return, I will be acquainted with him. If the young dace be a bait to catch the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature why I may not snap at him. Well, let time shape, the, and there's an end. Me. What is this forest called? It is Goltry Forest, then, to please your grace. Here stand, my lords, and send discoverers forth to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. It is well done. My friends and brethren in these great affairs, I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland, their cold intent, tenor, and substance thus. He is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland. Oh and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful meeting of their opposite. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Now, what news? West of this forest, scarcely up a mile in goodly form comes on the enemy. And by the ground they hide, I judge their number upon or near the rate of 30,000. The just proportion that we gave them out. Let us sway on and face them in the field. What well-appointed deed affronts us here? I think it is my lord of Westmoreland. Ah, health and fair greeting from our general, the Prince Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Say on, my lord of Westmoreland, in peace. What doth concern your coming? 
my lord archbishop. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and the boisterous tongue of war? Wherefore do I this? So the question stands. Briefly to this end, we are all diseased and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. Hear me more plainly and have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles, which long ere this we offered to the king, and might by no suit gain our audience. We are denied access under his person, even by those men that most have done us wrong. Whatever yet was your appeal denied, my good Lord Mowbray, were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's signories, your noble and right well-remembered father? What thing in honour had my father lost that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him, as the state stood then, was forced by force compelled to banish him. And then that Henry Bolingbroke and he, being mounted and both roused in their seats, their eyes of fire sparkling through sights of steel, then, then, when there was nothing could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke, or then the king did throw his warder down. Then threw he down himself and all their lives, that by indictment and by dint of sword have since miscarried under Bolingbroke. Uh, you speak, Lord Burberry, now you know not what, but this is mere digression from my purpose. Here come I from our princely general to know your grief and tell you from his grace that he will give you audience. And wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, <laughs> you shall enjoy them. Hath the Prince John a full commission in very ample virtue of his father to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the general's name. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take my Lord of Westmoreland this schedule, for this contains our general grievances. Each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, shall come within our awful banks again, and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. There is a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. Be you not that? If we can make our peace upon such large terms and so absolute, our peace shall stand as firm as rocky mountains. Therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do make our atonement well, our peace shall, like a broken limb united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Here is returned my Lord of Westmoreland. The Prince is here at hand. Please, if your lordship meet his grace just distance between our armies. Your grace of York. My lords, withdraw. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle lord archbishop. And so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My Lord of York, it better showed with you and that your flock assembled by the pair encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text than now to see you here. An iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum turning the word to sword and life to death. Who hath not heard it spoken how deep you were within the books of God? But to us, a speaker in his parliament, to us the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligencer between the grace, the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings. Oh, who shall believe? that you have turned up under the counterfeited zeal of God, the subject of his substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him, of here upswarm. Good, my lord of Lancaster, I am not here against your father's peace. 
I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our griefs, the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this hydra son of war is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and right desires. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, they shall second them, and so success of mischief shall be born. And air from air shall hold this quarrel up, whilst England shall have generations. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to sound the bottom of the aftertimes. Please, if your grace, to answer them directly, how far forth you do like their articles. <laughs> I like them all, and do allow them well. And swear here, by the honour of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook. And some about him have too lavishly wrested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers into their several counties as we will ours. And here between the armies, let's drink together, friendly and embrace, that all their eyes may bear those tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it to you, and will maintain my word. And thereupon I drink unto your grace. Go then. Deliver to our army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. I know it will well please them. I give them. To you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace. Health to my lord and gentle cousin Mowbray. You wish me health in very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. <laughs> Against ill chances, men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Believe me, I'm passing light in spirit. So much the worse if your own rule be true. A word of peace is rendered. Go, my lord, and let our army be discharged too. And good, my lord, so please you. And our trains march by us, that we may peruse the men we should have coped with all. Go, good lord Hastings, now they be dismissed, let them march by. I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. <laughs> now, cousin, wherefore stands our army? Their leaders, having charged from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they know their duties. Our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses. North, south, east, west. Or like a school broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. <laughs> Good tidings, my lord Hastings. For the which I do arrest you, traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop. And you, Lord Mowbray. Of capital treason, I do attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honourable? Is your assembly so? Will you thus break your faith? I pawn thee none. I promise to redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain. Which by mine honour I will perform with the most Christian care. But for you, rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. God, and not we, hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors in the block of death. Treason's true bed, and yield her up for fresh. Son of Gloucester. Where is the Prince of Wales, thy brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother Thomas of Clarence with him? No, good my lord, he is in presence here. Well, what would my lord and father? Oh. 
Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. Though thou chance thou art not with the prince, thy brother. He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, Thomas. Thou hast a better part in his affections than all thy brothers cherish it, my boy. A noble office is thou mayest effect of mediation after I am dead. For he is gracious if he be observed. The other tear for pity, the hand open as day for melting charity. Yet notwithstanding, being incensed his flint, as humorous as winter, sudden as flaws congealed in the spring of day. His temper, therefore, must be well observed. So shalt thou prove a shelter to thy friends, eh? a hoop of gold to bind thy brothers in, that the united vessel of their blood may never leak. I shall observe him with all care and love. Well, how chance thou art not at Windsor with him? He is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied canst thou tell me that? With poins and other his continual followers. <laughs> Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. Therefore my grief stretches itself before the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape in forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. My gracious lord, you look beyond him quite. Prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, whereon to gain the language. The prince will, in the perfectness of time, cast off his followers, turning past evils to advantages. Tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Who comes here? Was Westmoreland? Health to my sovereign and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Hastings, the bishop's group, Mowbray, and the rest are brought to the correction of your law and peace put forth the olive <laughs> everywhere. No matter how this action hath been wrought, here at more leisure may your highness read with every deed in his particular. Ah, Westmoreland, <laughs> thou art a summer bird, which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. Look, here's more news. From enemies, heaven keep your majesty. And when they stand against you, may they fall as those that I am come to tell you of. The old Northumberland and the Lord Morton, with the great power of English and of Scots, are by the shreve of Yorkshire overthrown. <laughs> the manner and true order of the fact this packet pleases you contains at large. <laughs> oh, wherefore should this good news make me sick? Will fortune never come with both hands full, but write her fair words still in foulest letters? I should rejoice now at this happy news. But now my sight fails and my brain is giddy. Come near me, lords, now I am much ill. Comfort, your majesty! Oh, my royal father! Stand from him! Give him air! He'll take me well! No, no, he cannot long hold out these bands! He's lower, princes! Have the king recovered? Oh. This apoplexy will certainly be his end! I pray you, take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. No, 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 softly, I pray.
Let there be no noise made, my good friends. On this some dull and favorable hand, whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for music in the other room. Fetch me the crown and set it on my pillow here. changes much. The incessant care and labor of his mind have wrought the muir that should confine it in, so thin that light looks through and will break out. People frighten me, for they do observe unfathered airs and loathly birds of nature. The river hath thrice flowed, no ebb between. Thus did it so a little time before that our great-grandsire Edward sit and die. Less noise. Here, brother, full of heaviness. And how? Rain within doors and none abroad? How doth the king? Exceeding ill. We've heard the good news yet. Tell it to him. He altered much upon the hearing it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, good lords. Good friends, speak low. The king, my father, is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Please it your grace to go along with us. No. I will sit and watch here with the king. So troublesome a bedfellow. Oh, polished perturbation. Golden care. That keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound, nor half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely, big and bound, snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty. When thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scores with safety. By his gates of breath, there lies a downy feather which stirs not. With his aspire, that light and weightless down for force must move. My gracious Lord, my father. His sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden rigel had divorced so many English kings. Thy due for me, his tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. Lie due from thee is this imperial crown, which is immediate to thy place and blood, derives itself to me. where it sits, which God shall guard and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee will I to mine leave. 
as it is left to me. my lords. We left the prince, my brother, here, my liege. One that took to sit and watch by you. The prince of Wales? Where is he? Let me see him. He came not through the chamber where we stay. Where's the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. Oh, oh the prince hath chained it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? Find him, my lord of Westmoreland, chide him hither. <laughs> oh, this part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. what things you are. How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes our object. For this, the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with cares, their bones with industry. For this, they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange, achieved gold. We're like the bees holding from every flower, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey. We bring it to the hive, and like the bees are murdered for our pains. <laughs> ah, where, where did he take the crown? Come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber. Leave us here alone. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was farther, Harry, to that thought. I stay too long by thee. I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honours before thy time is ripe? O oh, foolish youth, thou seekst the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Thou hast stolen that, which after some few hours had been thine without offence, and at my death thou hast sealed up mine expectation. Thy life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wouldst have me die assured of it. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts to stab. At half an hour of my life, ah, oh, what? Canst thou not forbear me half an hour? I then get thee hence and dig my grave thyself. Bid the merry bells ring to thine ears that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees. For now the time has come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up, vanity! Down, royal state, all you sage counsellors, hence! And to the English court assemble now from every region apes of idleness. Now, neighbor confines, purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? Be happy. We will trouble you no more. 
England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him honours, office, might. For the fifth Harry from curb license plucks the muzzle of restraint. And the wild dog shall flesh his tooth in every innocent door, my poor kingdom. Sick with civil blows. One that my care could not withstand thy riots, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Why, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thine old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege. Of my tears, the moist impediments under my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke. Hey, you with grief had spoke, or I had heard the course of it so far. There is your crown. Mm -hmm. And he that wears the crown immortally long guarded yours. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me know more from this obedience rise. God witness with me, when I first came in and found no cause of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do fain, oh, let me in my present wildness die, and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed it. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost my liege to think you were. I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it. The care of thee depending and fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou, best of gold and worst of gold. For accusing it, I, I, I put it on my head. To try with it as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, may God forever keep it from my head. Make me as poor as vassal is that does with awe and terror you do. Oh, my son. God put it in thy mind to take it hence. But thou mightst win the more thy father's love. Come hither, Harry. Sit thou by my bed. And here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son. By what bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. And I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee, it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation. For all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. In me, it seemed but as an honor snatched with boisterous hand. And I had many living to upbraid my gain of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrels and to bloodshed, wounding supposed peace. And all these bold fears thou seest, with peril I have answered it. For all my reign hath been but as a scene acting that argument. And now my death changes the mood. And what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. But yet, though thou stand'st more sure than I could do, mm. thou art not firm enough, since griefs are green, and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly ta'en out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a fear of being again displaced, mm. which to avoid, I cut them off, and had a purpose now, to lead out many to the Holy Land, lest rest and lying still should make them look too close unto our throne. Therefore, 
My Harry, be it thy course to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action hence borne out may waste the memory of the former days. Oh, oh more I would, but that my lungs are wasted so, that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How I came by this crown, oh God forgive, and grant with thee it may in true peace live. My loving lord, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me, then plain and right must my possession be which I, with more than with a common pain, against all the world will rightfully maintain. Does any name in particular belong to the lodging where I first did swoon? Uh, Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord. Lord be to God. Even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied me many years I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose the Holy Land. Then bear me to that chamber. There I lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. You shall not away tonight. What day be, I say? You must excuse me, good master Robert Shannon. I will not excuse you. Hmm? You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Why, Davy? Here, sir. Davy, 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 let me see. Davy, let me see. Davy, let me see. Yea, marry William Cook. Bid him come hither. Sir John, mm. you shall not be excused. Marry, sir, thus, those precepts cannot be served. And again, sir, shall we soak the hay land with wheat? With red wheat, Davy. But for William Cook, are there no young pigeons? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Here is now the Smith's note for shoeing and plough irons. Let it be cast and paid. Sir John. Mm. 
You shall not be excused. Now, sir, a new link to the bucket must needs be had. And, sir, do you mean to stop any of Williams's wages about the sack he lost the other day at Hinkley Fair? I shall answer it. Some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Tell William Cook. Does the uh, man of war stay all night, sir? <laughs> yea, Davy. I will use him well. A friend at court is better than a penny in purse. Use his men well, Davy, for they are arrant knaves and will backbite. No worse than they are backbitten, sir, for they have the most marvellous foul linen. Well conceited, Davy. About thy business, Davy. I beseech you, sir, to countenance William Visor of one caught against Clement Perks of the Hill. Well, there is many complaints, Davy, against that Visor. That Visor is an arrant knave on my knowledge. I grant your worship that he is a knave, sir, but yet, yeah, God forbid, sir, but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request. An honest man is able to speak for himself, sir, when a knave is not. I've served your worship truly these eight years, sir, and if I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against an honest man, I have but very little credit with your worship. The knave is mine honest friend, sir, therefore I beseech your worship, let him be countenanced. Go to, I say he shall have no wrong. Look about thee. Where are you, Sir John? Huh? Ah. <laughs> come, 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 off with your boots. Give me your hand, Master Bardo. I'm glad to see your worship. I thank thee with all my heart, kind Master Bardo, and welcome, my tall fellow. <laughs> Come, Sir John. I'll follow, Master Shallow. If I were sawed into quantities, I would make four dozen such hermit staves as this Master Robert Shallow. I will devise enough matter out of this Shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter. Oh, you shall see him laugh to his face be like a wet cloak. Laid up. Sir John. I come, Master Shallow. Hmm. I come, Master Shallow. How doth the king? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes, he lives no more. I would his majesty have called me with him. The service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. I know he doth not. And to arm myself to welcome the condition of the time, which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Here comes the heavy issue of dead Henry. Oh, God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morning, Uncle Exeter, good morning. We meet like man that had forgot to speak. We do remember. You have lost a friend indeed. Though no man be assured what grace to find, you stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier. Would twere otherwise. Sweet princess, what I did, I did in honor. But never shall you see that I will beg a ragged and forestalled remission. If truth and upright innocency fail me, I'll to the king, my master, that is dead. And tell him who hath sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow. And God save your majesty. This new and Gorgeous garment, majesty. This sits not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amurath, and Amurath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. 
Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my troth it very well becomes you. But entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heavens, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Well, let me but bear your loves, I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, that shall transform those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no otherwise from your majesty. Oh. You all look strangely on me. And you most. You are, I think, assured I love you not. I am assured, if I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No. How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Great rebuke and roughly sent to prison the immediate heir of England was as easy. May this be washed in leafy and forgotten. I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay then in me. Your Highness, please it to forget my place. The majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented and struck me in my very seat of justice. Ah. Whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and did commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented, wearing now the garlands to have a son set your decrees at naught, to pluck down justice from your awful bench. Question your royal thoughts. Make the case yours. Be now the father and propose a son. Hear your own dignity so much profaned. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted. Behold yourself so by a son disdained. And then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son. After this cold considerance, sentence me. And as you are a king, speak in your state what I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege's sovereignty. You're right, Justice. And you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. And I do hope your honours may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey who as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold that dare do justice on my proper son. And no less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. There is my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced, wise direction. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father has gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections. But with his spirit, sadly, I survive to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion that hath writ me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our High Court of Parliament, let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with our best governed nation, that war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. And God consigning to my good intents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life. One day.
Oh, God, you have a goodly dwelling here and a rich. Baron, Baron, beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. Marry good air. Spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Well said, Davy. This Davy serves you for good uses. He is both your serving man and your husband. A good marlot. A good marlot. A very good marlot. By the mass, I've drunk too much sack at supper. It's a good marlot. Now, sit down, now, sit down. Come, cousin. Oh, Mary, quoth us. We shall do nothing but eat and make good cheer. And praise God for the merry year when flesh is cheap and females dear. And lusty lads roam here and there so merrily. I never am on so merrily. <laughs> It's a merry heart, good master, silence. <laughs> Give Master Bard off some wine, Davy. <laughs> no sweet master, sit. Uh, I'll be with you anon. Most sweet master, sit. Master Page, good Master Page, sit. No face. What do you want in me? We'll have and drink, but you must bear, cause the heart's all. Be merry once more, all, and my little soldier there, be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife has all. For women are shoes, both short and tall. Be merry in the hall when the beard swags all. So welcome, merry. I did not think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. Who, I? I have been married twice and once there now. Here's a dish of leather coats for it. Davy! Sir! I'll be with you anon. <laughs> Another cup of wine, sir. Who's bad off? Welcome. If thou wantst anything and wilt not call, we shrew thy heart. And welcome indeed to I'll drink to Master Bar. Oh, look who's at door there. Hold. Hold on. Now you've done me right. Do me right and dub me night. So Mingo, it's not so. It is so. So, why then, say an old man can do somewhat? <laughs> Sir, there's one pistol come from the court with news. From the court? Let him come in. Senor! How now, pistol? God save you. Senor, what wind blew you hither, pistol? Not the ill wind that blows no man to good. Sweet night. Thou art now one of the greatest men in this realm. <laughs> Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend. And helter skelter have I roads to thee. And tidings do I bring. And lucky joys. And golden times. And happy news of price. I will obey, Sicilian knight. What is thy news? Let King Cofetua know the truth thereof. And Robin Hood, Scarlet, and John. <laughs> Shall Dungal Curse confront the Helicons? And shall good news be baffled? Ooh. Then, Pistol, lay thy head in Fury's lap. Arms, gentlemen, I know what you're breathing. Why then lament, therefore? Give me funds. If so, you come with news and court. I take it there's but two ways either to utter them or conceal them. I am, sir, under the king, in some authority. Under which king, Bersonian? Speak or die! Ah, the king had it! Harry the fourth or fifth? Had it fourth! Ah, future for thine office! Sir John, thy tender lambkin now is king. Harry the fifth's the man! <laughs> I speak the truth! If pistol lies, do this and feed me like the bragging Spaniard. 
But is the old king dead? That's nearly door. The things I speak are just... Oh, my sweet pistol! Ah. Bardo, saddle my horses! Yeah. Master Shadow, choose what office thou wilt in the land is thine. Pistol! Pistol! I will double charge thee with dignities! Oh, a joyful day! I wouldn't give a light out for my fortune. <laughs> Master Shallow, my lord Shallow, be you what thou wilt. I am fortune steward. Get on thy boots, we'll ride all night. Bard off away, hold my sweet pistol out of more to me, and with all device, something to do thyself good. Boot, boot, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. <laughs> Blessed are they that are my friends. And woe to the Lord Chief Justice. Let vultures vile seize on his lungs also. <laughs> Where is the life that late I let say there? Why, here it is. Welcome, these pleasant days. Oh! Where is the life that late I let? I'll warrant you, for there's been a man or two killed about her lately. Cook, you lie. I'll tell you what that damn tripe is, he's rascal. And the child I'll go with do miscarry. Now what better than I would strike thy mother, that piper boy villain? Try to go Sir John were here. He might just have bloody day for somebody. But I'll pray to God the fruit of a womb do miscarry. Come, I'll charge you both. Go with me, for the man is dead. But you're a pistol beat amongst you. I'll tell you what you think, man, in a sense, sir. What? I will have you a soundly swing for this. You blue bottle rogue! You filthy famous connector! Oh, God! The right should thus overcome might! <laughs> 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 Come and stand here by me, Master Shallow. I will make the king do you grace. I will leer up at him as he passes by, and do you but mark the countenance he will give me. God bless thy lungs. Good night. Come and stand here behind me, good Lieutenant Pistol. Oh, if only I've had time to have me made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pounds that I borrowed of thee, but tis no matter this. Poor show doth better. He doth infer the zeal I have to see him. It does so. My earnestness of affection. It does so. My devotion. It does, it does, it does. As it were to ride day and night, not to remember, not to deliberate, not to have patience to shift me. It is best, certainly. But to stand here stained with travel, sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else, putting all affairs else into oblivion, as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him. It is... Semper idem, for obsque hoc nihil est. It is all in every part. It is true indeed, Mr. John. I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy dog, Helen of thy noble thoughts, is in base duties and contagious prison. Hell thither, thy most mechanical and dirty hand. Round of revenge from Ebon's den. With Telelecto's snake, the doll is in. Pistol speaks not for truth. I will deliver her. <laughs> the Lord of the sea. Then <laughs> trumpet clang a sound. <laughs> Speak to that vain man. Have you no 
Let no one let you speak. My king, my Jove, I speak to thee in my heart. I know thee not. Old man, fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man. So surfeit swell, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive, that I have turned away my former self, so will I those that kept me company. And now as here I am as I have been, approach me and thou shalt be as thou wast the tutor and the feeder of my lives. Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten miles. For confidence of life I will allow you, that lack of means enforce you not to evils. And as we hear you to reform yourselves, we shall, according to your strength and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my lord, to see perform the tenor of our world. Set on. Yea, marry, Sir John, which I beseech you to let me have home with me. It can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not you grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must appear thus to the world. Fear not your advancements. I shall yet be the man that will make you great. I cannot perceive how, unless you should lend me your doublet and stuff me up with straw. Good Sir John, I beseech you, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a colour. A colour that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear no colours. Come, go with me to dinner. Lieutenant Pistol. Madoff. I shall be sent for soon at night. Go, carry Sir John Falstaff to prison. Take all his company along with him. Lord, Lord, I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take it away. See fortune, may terminate. Spare on me, contender. I like this fair proceeding of the kings. He hath intent his wonted followers will all be very well provided for. And so they are. 
The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come. What do you have? <laughs> In a foreign land Uncle Sam does the best he can You're in the army now Oh, oh, you're in the army now Now you remember what the draft man said Nothing to do all day But stay in bed You're in the army now Oh, 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 you're in the army 